Good morning, World Outreach Revival Center. Can we get Jesus to start of praying? It's so good to have you with us today. Our God is an awesome God. We're going to open in prayer and just get right into worship. We hope you had a good Christmas time and uh, maybe able to enjoy some family. And uh, we're going to just have a good time with the Lord today and invite His presence. Father, we pray right now. In the name of Jesus, that you will let your spirit be free, ascend upon us, descend upon us, God. Flow like a river, Lord. Anoint the worship team. Let your glory fill this place. Father, we honor you. We need you. We love you so much. We surrender everything that we are. That will ever be to you in Jesus' mighty name. And we all sin. Amen. Amen. If you're joining us on Facebook, just worship the Lord. Let him come to where you're at. Come on, Caleb.
Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Facebook. We love you. We miss you. We can't wait for you all to be with us again. I know you're excited to praise the Lord this morning, the ones we have here this morning, and you in your homes. I know you're ready. So let's just continue to worship Him this morning and give Him everything we have. I was buried beneath my shame. Who could carry that kind away? Till I met you Oh, my name. 
pleasant. My brother's here visiting for a couple of weeks. Well, a week now. He's leaving for leaving this week. So uh, I was actually with my mom at church over there this morning. So, uh, but it was a good, good, a good day. But prior to that, two days prior to that, I mentioned this last week is uh, was my 30th year of serving the Lord. So I'm excited about that. December 23rd, 1990. So yeah, I still remember that 15 year old knucklehead that came in here. <laughs> I try to forget him, but he still comes up. I see him in the mirror every now and then behind all this gray and all that. But when I hear a song like that, it reminds me of that day. And, and you know, in spite of who I was, he did all that for me. Amen. It's good stuff, man. Wow. Hard to grasp the love of God. How many of you in here can say that 100% you deserved all the grace and love he gave you? Yeah, that's what I thought. <laughs> Nobody's put their hand up. I'm, I'm right there with you. Uh, my goodness. Well, I'm supposed to be doing an offering, but I'm caught up in the song and the moment there, so I guess we'll just do the offering. <laughs> I don't know about you, but I think given the past year, this this might be a good season, maybe these next couple of, uh, of Sundays, to plant a good seed. So, you know, uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to sow and reap. Because uh, I don't know about you guys, but I would love to reap even more next year. Can I get an amen from somebody, yeah? So I, I want to challenge you. You know, I, I know after Christmas, everybody's broke usually. Uh, it, it, but uh, let's let's start thinking in that mindset. Because uh, I, I think that 2021 is going to be a, a, a transition year for a lot of things. And uh, hopefully financially for a lot of us. And uh, I'm looking forward to his blessing. Amen. So, uh um, I guess the next time that we get together will be will be next year, right? It'll be the 20, 2021 next week, right? Yeah. So I guess I'm speaking maybe next week. Oh wow! I gotta figure out. I'm not gonna encore last year's message was pretty good. I don't know if I can. You know, anyway, we'll see what the Lord does. <laughs> that being said, I hope that everyone, my family in here. Uh, in addition to the family online, that you guys will join us next week. It's very sparse in here. Lots of vacant seats. We have plenty of room to stretch out. So we're social distancing with an extra bonus here. We, we don't need this much space. Amen? So anyway, praise the Lord. All right. If you got an offering today and you want to give something to the Lord, I don't have anything profound to give you today. Any wisdom other than he's good soil. This is good soil. Let's invest in the kingdom of God and see what he's going to do in this coming year. So if you got something to give today, why don't you lift it before the king? Father, we thank you for an opportunity to give to you once again. We thank you, Lord, that this year has been a crazy year, but you've blessed us. You've sustained us. Many, Lord, you've even been blessed beyond. Many of our family are on vacation right now, which is an awesome thing. And I celebrate with them. What a great opportunity to go and see all the things that you've created. So, Father, we ask for protection over them while they're all gone. But Lord, I just pray that you meet the needs of this house. Bless each and every one as they give. I pray that you meet all their needs, Father, in Jesus' mighty name. And I thank you, Father. Somebody say amen. amen. I didn't say it a moment ago, but I'll say it now. Good morning, family. Good morning. Got caught up in the moment there. So that being said, the Bible says we need to be cheerful for givers. It's now time to give the offering. Shout of praise, can you? Thank you, Caleb. Beautiful job. Caleb, thank you for that song. And uh, 
the worship that uh, worship song, Isabella, that you guys do. Was it just you? It's good to have Isabella with us today. Yeah. Um, the song that she uh, did led us in. Um, what's the name of that song? That's beautiful. Powerful. Powerful, powerful song. Giving God some praise. Um, I want to pray over the word this morning and just share a couple things God put in my heart. And uh, just continue to pray for our county. A lot of people have been sick and there's a lot of prayer requests uh, out there right now with the COVID. Um, good people that need healed. So, and the, how many know he is the healer? Amen. He is Jehovah Rope. Father, we come before you. We ask you to bless your word this morning. Lord, bless the words that I speak. Lord, let my mind be set aside. Let your name be glorified. Your name be praised. Your name be honored. We thank you for your goodness, your grace, and your mercy. Let your word be alive in our hearts. In Jesus' name, we all said, Amen. Amen. Well, on the 1st of December, we were supposed to, uh, in, well, somewhere before there, install the carpet in the Children's Church building. And uh, unfortunately, uh, that nasty word called COVID hit Thanksgiving and uh, kind of adjusted everybody's plans. For those that don't know, we had at least 15 in the church that got hit with that sickness. That sickness then caused those 15 and their, all of their families to isolate themselves. And then those that decided, hmm, it's probably better I stay away, isolated themselves. So long story short is uh, most of our church has been in isolation. But I'm going to say this, thank God, because uh, there are churches right now that are completely closed down because of this thing. So they've literally shut the doors uh, for several weeks. And we've been blessed to be able to stay functioning. Sister Tammy and I got the decided to share a little love, and, um, and, and uh, so it, it, it made its way through, but uh, praise God, we came through the other side. Someone said, uh, and you know, here's the thing, um, but it affects everybody differently. For some of the young people, it's just like it got some sniffles, a couple of headaches, and a few things like that. It just went right through. For some of us that might have a small amount of age on us, it hit us a little different. We've also seen some 80-year-olds that it just hit them and gone. Uh, uh, for Sister Tam and I, it felt like something was in our body trying to kill us every single day. And uh, for, uh, I, I want to say, the second week, it was a battle. Am I going to make it through this or not? And your, your mind is saying, keep going and trust God. And uh, that's what we did. So uh, we weren't terrible, but it was just felt terrible. And, um, uh, but thank the Lord, uh, our family, Tina had it and it hit their home, but most of them are like immune to it. And then Mandy had it and hit their home. And, um, yeah, so praise God. And I know many in the house have had it and thank the Lord that they've gotten healed and passed it. And we're moving forward with the Lord. Amen. 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 How many know this is an election year? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Just making sure you still realize that. Um, I want to bring a little bit of God's word to you today. Two things God showed me, um, and, and uh, this is going to be out of the book of Ephesians chapter 6 and 2 Corinthians. And this is no revelation, but there's revelation in this to me. And I just want to share from my heart to you what the Spirit of God, I shared with Isabella before service. Sister Tammy put a, a, a television show on late last night. I normally don't watch any TV that often. The Holy Spirit spoke to me so strongly through the show, it, I went to bed, shook on the inside in a very good way. And I got up this morning and I, and I just said, Lord, where are we at? And, um, you know, we, we have a, a strange year going on. We have an election that is absolutely disputed. We have all kinds of things that are going crazy. Uh, it, it's very possible that this election could be disputed even more. We don't know what the future holds. 
It's very possible that our nation can go to many levels of different attitudes and so forth and so on. And somewhere in the middle of that, starting in uh, February, is the Church of Jesus Christ. And we've, we've made it through. I don't know how many in here, and I'm not acting like 2021 is going to be like the supernatural greatest year in the world, which I would love it to be. But I'm saying 2020 needs to get over with. And, you know, the closer we get, you know, I just hear stuff. And, you know, we have uh, just buried Sister Tammy's uh, mother yesterday. Um, two months ago, she was healthy, <laughs> living in her home, doing her own thing, 91-year-old and great. She didn't get the COVID. She just slipped and fell. And that was all she wrote and, and didn't get hurt bad in the fall. But it was the timing of God that... You know, two months later, she's going to go to be with the Lord. We've had some other tragedy in our family, still waiting on God to do a miraculous miracle with uh, be my brother-in-law, I guess it would be. Uh, and he had a, a bad fall. But just, just one thing after another, this whole entire year that we hear, um, in our town there are men uh, and women that people are praying for that are, are uh, good people. Uh, and and it's, just, it's just like... Where are we at, God? And here's what I want to say. I, I can't answer the question where we're at. I can't even answer the question what's going to happen in uh, uh, the inauguration or any of that. I can't, I can't tell you what's going to happen in uh, 2021. But I can tell you what God says. And that's all I can hold on to. Because he's the only one that I can rely on, that I can rest in, that I can find my peace and my strength in. Can I get an amen? Yeah. So he reminded me of two passages this morning. So I want to go, uh, first we're going to go to the book of uh, 2 Corinthians. And this is a very uh, familiar, if you've been here any length of time, very familiar with most of you because this is, I've lived off of this particular verse my entire Christian walk. And this is chapter 10, 2 Corinthians, verse 3. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war with this flesh. The weapons of our warfare, this is for the Christian, are not carnal, but they are mighty through God to pulling down our strongholds. Verse 5 is something that I've had to hold on to, sometimes harder than others. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. We're in a season and time where there's a mental warfare such as I've never seen on planet Earth. From depressions to suicides to discouragements to everything in between, there's a warfare that has been loose. I, I told someone yesterday, I said, I feel like not only has that COVID thing come, but almost like a spirit of death has come against our nation where many people have died unrelated to COVID. It's, it's very, very strange. And so we're in this place, and the mind likes to just go crazy, and the enemy likes to attack the thought process. If you can live in a bubble, if you have been living in a bubble, that's a good place to be. But if you get out of there and you start hearing what's going on, it's a very scary place to be. But it says, the weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but they're mighty through God to pulling down the strongholds. They cast down imagination. Every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God and brings into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. Now I want to go to the book of Ephesians, if you would, chapter 6. And this is on the armor of God, which everyone in here should know inside and out. But we're going to go to chapter 6, verse 10. And it says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of God. His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the schemes of the devil. 
For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in the high places. Wherefore, take of you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand in the evil day, having done all, stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, wherewith you'll be able to quench the fiery darts of the wicked. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, watching with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. He speaks about putting on the armor of God. And one thing that I was studying today, and maybe um, we've taught it wrong in the past, but I've often taught myself that the armor is for the front. And so Christians never retreat. But when you study the armor of that day, it also covered the back. So it was front and back. So those that think that God leaves your backside vulnerable if you seem to feel a little weak, it's in error because he is around you all the way. Come on. And he's given us the ability to stand in the armor. Now, I want to read this to you again. Put on the whole armor of God that we're able to stand. We wrestle not against flesh and blood but against principalities and powers and rules of darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Verse 12 refers to the battle, and I want you to know there's not one place in verse 12 where it refers just to the physical. These are all spiritual battles. It's all spiritual. Matter of fact, in my Bible, he breaks it down, and I, I won't go into all of it. It's four, four kinds of spirit rebels, and he breaks them down of who they are. And what we go through. And I want to go this way. Stand. Verse 14. Stand having your loins girt about with truth. How many know Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life? We know that. He is the truth. Having our loins girt about with truth. Having the breastplate. So... We often speak on the armor, but this is really just a symbol. What he's referring to is the armor is truth. The armor is my righteousness that's around you. The armor is my protection for your legs and carrying the gospel of peace. The armor is faith that we carry. The armor is salvation that is on our mind. And what he's saying to the church is just like a soldier. We walk in truth. We walk in righteousness. We walk in faith. We walk with the word. We walk prepared to carry the gospel, being prepared at any given moment. That's the call to the church. One of the things I saw the enemy do this morning is I was just meditating and listening. Do you realize that our nation has been divided into two groups completely? Democrats and Republicans. Do you understand the diabolical scheme of Satan is to divide and separate God's people? The Christian church has been sucked right into the battle zone. And so here we are in a spiritual warfare, but we're reacting in the natural realm, and you have Christians that are divided down the center, and you have this group are Democrats, so it depends on what side you're on, they're no good, or this side is Republicans, and depending on what side you're on, they're no good, and the church of Jesus Christ is finding itself 
sucked into the middle of a political battle as well. <clears throat> Do you understand the spiritual warfare of the enemy is separation? The spiritual warfare of the enemy is to get our eyes focused on the battle more than on the God that we serve. Come on. Yeah. The assignment of the enemy is to take the church and rattle her starting the beginning of this year. And I know God is involved and I know God allows it. And I know somehow, someway God is shaking the church like this so that she'll open her eyes and shake off some of the junk and become who she's supposed to be. And this world has definitely been through it this year. We come through all of the COVID and all of the restrictions and all of the fears. And for some, the finances have been fine. And for others, they're starving to death. And all this stuff is going on throughout our nation and our world. And we can say, well, Lord bless America. No, this has hit the entire world. And then we come right around to prophecies and we come right around to an election. And now we're coming right to the other end of utter chaos can be in front of us. And people are warning and people are crying and people are screaming. This is what's going to happen. And the focus of the church is either on fear or anxiety or on worry or on political situations. Or who's going to take the presidency or what's going to happen to our nation or what's going to happen to our rights. You better Get a gun, old church. Prophets prophesying, load your guns. Prophets prophesying, get your food. I'm not saying they're wrong. I'm saying if that becomes the focus, we're wrong. Yes. I'm saying when we are driven by the mouth and the force of fear, it's a spirit of the enemy and not the spirit of the God we serve. Don't think for a second we're not in the midst of a spiritual warfare. Demons have been loosed like nothing I've ever seen in my life. The demonic forces that are attacking the church and the church can act oblivious or they can act like, well, let's just sit back and trust God. And I'm going to say this. I, I, I found myself caught in a category I love Jesus, and I just kind of sat back in the chair and said, God, I don't know the outcome. I don't know what prophets are right and what prophets are wrong, but I trust you. And last night, God said to me, David, I didn't call you just to trust me. You're in error. He said, I called you to be in warfare. I called you to be in the things I called you to be. And what's happened, I just, I know this, and I'm not putting everybody, because if you want to be truthful, I'll put a mirror in front of me and just preach to me. But my focus has been so beat up. Have I loved the Lord? Yes. Have I trusted him? Yes. Have I walked with him? Yes. Have I read his word? Yes. We battle through it, but somewhere in the midst of it, I feel like the enemy really did get my focus. Just being for real. I've been transparent my whole ministry, so I'm not going to lie to anybody. It's not that I've backslid and gone off the other side. It's just my focus has been kind of manipulated without me even recognizing the fullness of it. Because I'm praying, oh God, we need the anointing. Oh God, we need revival. Oh God, our nation needs touched by you. Oh God, whether it be by judgment, then get us right. Or whether it be by your blessing, he can do it anyway. Two, three weeks ago, God had me preach a message. He says, I can do it this way with requirements or I can do it sovereignly because I'm God. I can do it any way I want. And so the first thing he spoke to my spirit is, David, the world, the church is always under spiritual assignments. They're demonic forces that have strength over nations. And then they have groups under them that they send out. 
But don't be afraid because greater is he that is in you and I than he that's in the world. Don't be afraid because the authority inside of you is greater than the authority of the enemy. Don't be afraid because 2,000 years ago on the cross of Calvary a sacrifice was made and three days later a resurrection came and defeated and destroyed all the power of the enemy. And God says, I place that authority in the church of Jesus Christ. Yeah, man. So what does the enemy do? His best scheme is to distract, to manipulate the mind, to refocus a people. Because if he can, he shuts down the power and the vision and the purpose that they're called to. I was thinking as I was meditating this week, I said, God, what would I preach on? And I feel like the Lord is saying for this year, soul. Bring you to a movie that my wife played last night. And I don't try not to share too much on the movie industry, but nonetheless, she played it. And I didn't know she probably did. It was a Christian show. So the show starts out with a family. They have two children. The wife and husband are in a real bad mood. The house is in turmoil. The woman is not happy at all. She lost her father, and now her husband is terminally ill. So she's in a real bad way. It's Christmas, and all of her family's coming over, and she just don't want to talk to them. She's got one brother that's an atheist that's still 30 years old living with mom, and she's not happy about that. She's got the other sister that's going to be a little bossy and her mom that has got this mindset that, you know, everything's got to be proper and perfect. And so they're coming to her house and she don't want them there because she's got bad news and she's not happy. So it's a miserable day and a miserable place. So Sunday morning comes around and they get ready and they go to church. The dad and the two kids go to church. And the mom's mad at God. She's staying home. After all, life has dealt them some tough stuff. So she's got her focus in anger and an attitude, knowing everyone's coming over. And sure enough, they do come over. And the mom is, you know, she's just not the easiest person to deal with. And the sister's not the easiest person to deal with. And her brother, well, yeah, he's still living with mom, and he's not paying rent, and he's all this, and he's all that. And she's got a bad attitude. And most of the show, they're almost in a fight continuously, except. During the worship service, there's a man singing. He's a visitor in the church. And he sings this beautiful song with the choir and the singers. And all of the church is staring at this guy. Because he's not singing like everybody else. Yes, his voice is angelic. His voice is incredible. But his expression is... I'm not singing to the choir. I'm not singing to the people around me. He's looking straight through the heavens. You can tell he doesn't see a ceiling. He's looking straight to the throne of God and singing the song to God. Service is over. <clears throat> so the man and his two children step out and they're speaking to the pastor. And just by some chance, this man happens to be there. They ask the man where he's from. He doesn't say much. He just stands there and stares at him. The pastor asks the man, he says, well, what are you doing for Christmas? He says, I don't have no plans. What, are you going somewhere to eat? Nope. And he looks at the man and his two children, and the kids say, Dad, can you come to eat with us? The man says, well, we've got family coming over. Why not? So he brings him in. Now the wife doesn't know that, so she's in curlers and all this, and she's not very happy about it. It just escalates things. Long story short, this stranger comes to the house. And during the process of the show, you begin to realize this stranger is an angel. He was sent there to help them through their problems. Every time he opened his mouth. And I love it because they're in this conversation, an atheist conversation, and, and he didn't get into a debate. He just started talking about the faithfulness of God. 
And here's the thing that, that got me. Even the guy begins to sing, and they don't know he's an angel. I, you do because I told you the end of the story. But no one knows he's an angel. He plays the piano, and he's singing Joy to the World. And he sings Joy to the World like nothing you've ever heard. It's like this guy is really singing Joy to the World. <laughs> then he turns around, and all the family's sitting there crying because that was the dad's favorite song. You know, they had to put that type of stuff in there. And he turns around, and they're staring at it. And he just starts telling them the story of the birth of Christ. And they're sobbing on the couch. And one of them says, you tell the story like you were there. He never said a word. Just kept telling the story. And all through the house, everything that came up, he just told them about the faithfulness and the love of God. He told the woman when she was upset over her husband, he said, trust him. We don't know the outcome, but you have to trust God. And I'm going to say this. When I saw it, it's as if this guy's face jumped off the tube. On, I mean, it's like, my God, you're speaking to me. And what the Lord was saying to me, first of all, was David, my church has to trust me. Amen. Yeah. In all that's been going on and going to go on, my church is the one above it. Come on. Secondly, it's hard to say this, but sometimes I preach what I don't live. Wow. Everybody does. How many ever told someone what to do but know that you really haven't done it yourself? <laughs> and what I found myself this year is hearing the voice of God instructing us for an intimacy with Him. And what I found myself doing is the things I'm supposed to do, like praying, like reading the word, like sharing the gospel, like doing the things that I do as a Christian. And when I'm watching this angelic guy on this show, I'm saying to myself, God he is not speaking to them as if he's from the earth, but he's speaking to them from a place he has been with you. Are you hearing me? That's why he could look at the woman who is, whose husband is dying and she's pregnant and has two children, and he looks at her and says, don't worry, just trust him. What kind of nonsense is that? Do you know what I'm going through? He's about to die. I'm going to have a baby. I've got two children. I'm about to be a widow and you're saying trust God. How can he say that except for he's not coming from earth to God. He's coming from God to earth. Yes. yes. You see, he was speaking out of the place that he'd been walking in with God. He told the story of the nativity because he was there. He sang joy to the world because he understood it. He told them trust God because he saw the power of the living God. And he eventually leaves and it's a good story. They all love God and love each other. The atheists get saved. It's a great story. <laughs> but what God spoke to me, he said, David, I told you two weeks ago, if you were here, you heard me preach. God said, and this is an old message, and he reminded me two weeks ago or last week, he says, do not preach from earth to heaven, but speak from heaven to earth. He said, if you're going to share, I don't want you to share as if you're trying to reach heaven. Share from heaven, trying to reach earth. That's where the power is. And when I saw this show, I'm thinking, dear God, he is doing what I said. He is speaking from a level that has such calmness, that has such authority, that has such power, that crushes the head of the enemy without him even bothered. Now, they did throw a couple of cool things in there. The one 
brother was like a football star. And they, the, the guy was trying to figure out how do I even hold the football. And then they said, um, well, just throw it as far as you can. You don't tell it to me, Joel. And this guy is all bragging and stuff. And he tells the boy in front of him, he says, I'm just going to go about 10 yards. That's probably all we can throw the ball anyway. Well, on the other side of the football field was the guy's car. <laughs> the angel says, shoop. And the ball goes. He says, not the car, not the car, not the other car. <laughs> Cute little things they threw in there. But the thing that got me the most was that this angel was speaking from first hand. He was living from first hand experience. You can't live off of yesterday's manna. We can't live off the revelation that we got a week ago. Although it's good. We've got to live off of the intimate place that we have encountered today. The place that we've walked, where we've been in that circle where it's just God and you, and all the other stuff falls off. The chaos of life has no effect in there. I've been in this long enough to know. I've been there, and I've seen people there. We've all walked it. When you're in his presence, it seems like nothing else matters. I've had times where I have 102 fever and I was preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ on a Sunday morning and never felt the first sickness until I left the building. I came in sick and when I got home I was sick. But in his presence there was nothing going on. Do you understand what I'm saying? There is no anxiety. There is no fear. There is no depression. There is no worry about the future. There is no concern about what a president or president is going to be. There is no concern about a COVID virus or any other virus. There is no concern about China or Russia or Iran or what anybody's going to do. There is only the concern is I've been in the presence of the living God and I'm going to do what he says. He is my strength. He is my peace. He is my armor. I'm clothed with his salvation. It covers my mind. I have the mind of Christ. I have his righteousness. I'm made righteous because of him. I walk with truth and truth circles around me and it's tied upon my body so that the truth can hold all the, all the weapons that I need. The truth will hold my sword. The truth will hold my shield. The truth will hold my dagger. The truth will hold everything I need for warfare. And right in the midst of that, his faith, he's the author and the finisher of my faith. His faith will rise up and stop the fiery darts of the enemy. His word will become my sword and I will strike down every assignment and my feet are prepared to go where he says go and I will not fear because I'm not trying to do something for him. I'm doing something from him. I'm caught in his glory and his glory is leading me. Moses took 600,000 plus people and stood before a sea. The enemy behind them. What are we going to do? People started doing what we do. Complaining, getting aggravated. We're going to die. Probably some of the young tough guys said, get your, get your hammers and your pitchforks and we're going to go to war. getting ready for the battle. And then Moses says, see the salvation of our God. Why? Because Moses was not trying to reach heaven from the earth. Moses had already reached heaven and was being led on earth. Yes, Lord. Amen. And Moses stood and held the staff and said, let's go forward. And the Spirit of God breathed upon the waters, and they crossed over on dry ground. No one expected that to happen. But the man that had spent time with the Father, he had the faith to believe. One thing we study about the armor, and this is the coolest thing, and I am closing. Kate, if you want to come. 
All of you know this. They said the armor was about the, the shield. There's a buckler and a shield. You've read that in your Bible. The buckler is a small shield. You can almost smack somebody with it. But when you're in real warfare, the armor is about three quarters the height of the man. And the armor is designed so that you don't war by yourself. The armor is designed to make a wall that the enemy cannot penetrate through. So if I hook my armor to Brother Allen, and I hook my armor on this side to Tony, we have three shields. And if we keep doing that, we build a wall. And you're behind that wall, linked to each other. That's why the enemy knows if he can separate, if he can get an entire nation to forget about sinners and Christians, to forget about saved and unsaved, but just to focus on Democrats and Republicans. Come on. That's what most of the church in this nation is thinking right now. You should, if you read it, you can, you, it's unbelievable. It's as if, depending on what class you're on, the others are just garbage. That's what it is. No man has devised that. That's demonically driven. But it doesn't change the fact that our world has the saved and the unsaved. Doesn't change the fact that the church has to lock its shields together and stand in faith. But the church must go spend time on the mountain of the Lord. Moses went on the mountain and on the mountain he said, show me your glory. He didn't even know what he got. But when he came down, they had to cover his face because it was like horns of lightning shooting out of his face. <laughs> They saw this great fiery glow coming from him. You see, when you're in his presence, you may not know. But when you come from his presence to the world, the world is affected. I remember these stories, I think, of some of the great men of old. One of them, I forget which one, Wigglesworth, Finney, or somebody, was in the office praying. Listen to me close. He was in the office praying. But he wasn't just praying. Oh, God, send your anointing. Oh, God, move. Shut the color up on the high. Oh, God, we need you by the enemy. It was he entered into the cloud of the presence. You see, you can't pray eight or ten hours a day solid in one. I'm not talking about walking and praying. I'm talking about you're stuck in one spot praying for eight or ten hours. You cannot do that unless you entered into something that is beyond the natural. He said, that man understood. I'm coming into the heavenly realm of his presence. And I like what it said. I, I, I don't have it exactly right, but... Three ministers went in with him to pray. So four pastors are going to have prayer meeting. It didn't take too long where the one runs out because he can't breathe. The next one crawls out because he can't hardly stand it. He's about to die. The third one runs out of there. They said, what's going on? I couldn't even breathe in that room because that fourth minister created an atmosphere 
that heaven dominates. And so that minister was ministering from heaven to earth. Those ministers were ministering from earth to heaven. Those are looking for power to be in their lives and it's not there because they've not spent the intimate time at the very throne room of God. But that other minister, when he walked past somebody, conviction hit them. I don't know about you, but I'm tired of the condition of the body of Christ. And I'm not going to point fingers as anybody else, but I'm going to look in the mirror. And I'm going to say, God, I need to be where and what you've called me to be. Please forgive me. I'm going to confess to you. But I told Sister Tammy, I said, I've been preaching in the anointing. And I've been preaching in the calling. But I've not been preaching from that intimacy. Are you hearing me? We can live it. But there's a place. You know how you know someone's there? Don't watch them. Watch everyone around them. Someone says, well, I've been in the throne of God. Okay, let's see what you do. Walk in a crowd and see what happens. Are the demons screaming? Are people getting healed? Are people falling down because you just happened to brush them? Are people weeping because they feel the conviction? Because if they're not, just maybe, just maybe you need a little more time in the oven with God. I'm not judging anyone, guys. This is mostly for me today. You see, I'm anointed. I've been anointed from God since he put that oil on me and called me. And he will bless it. And he'll use me. He's given me great revelation. And I'm excited in who he is. And through all that we've gone through, I've survived and made it through because he is faithful. I'm called by God to do what I do. And he carries you through the call. But he said, David, you see that guy on the television show? That's where I want you to minister from. You can say, well, that's a secular show. It doesn't matter to me. God can use a donkey. He can use television. Because everything the guy said, you could tell. Oh, the writers were geniuses. Because you could tell he's speaking from a whole other dimension. so jealous last night. Maybe I got so jealous. I said, oh God. That's where I'm supposed to be. Didn't I tell you that, Tam? I said, that's where I'm supposed to be. Not that I'm an angel. But I know people. But I want to spend so much time with him that when you look at me, you see him in my eyes. When you walk past me, you know that I've been in his presence. When I pray for you, you know that I've already been touching heaven. Are you understanding? We spend more time speaking spiritual warfare and, and, and please forgive me. We spend more time, you know, reading the Bible or going to church or doing the things we do, even praying. We spend more time doing that than we do in this intimate slowdown. David said, search me, O God, and show me if there's any wicked way inside of me. So Isabella, when you did that song, I just spent most of the time repenting. I believe this is the most chaotic time that our nation has ever gone through since I've been alive. I also believe this can be the greatest hour of the church that she's ever had if she will spend time.
omniscient. Do you know that intimacy brings unity? Yeah. I've been with pastors. We got to all get together. No, we don't because we can't do it. We don't like each other. It's true. We don't agree in a single conversation. Our doctrines don't line up and our politics don't line up. We can't get together. If we do, it's going to be on eggshells because we, you know, we can eat together, but that's all. Someone might get mad. It's truth. But tell the truth, Marvin, it's facts. But I've been in those circles. Far and few between. Nine pastors from all different walks, different denominations in a small room. And we're praying. And all of a sudden it starts getting louder. And louder. You got Baptists and Pentecostals and you got non-denominationals and you got all different groups. But for the moment, there's a rising of praise and prayer. And then there's a roar. And all these grown men that are leading the church of Jesus Christ don't even know what to do with it because they're feeling God and they're feeling unity and they're feeling His presence and they had an encounter with Him in the same atmosphere and they were able to lay down the politics and lay down the theologies and lay down the doctrinal thought process and just worship the King of glory. Because for that moment, His presence filled the room. Can you imagine if His church, you and I, this week, really get in that place? And then we come back next Sunday. And we're not coming here from our home. We're coming here from his presence. Oh, yeah. Then it explodes. Do you understand? I've seen God in a single second take men and women that despise each other and kill them because his presence showed up. I'm going to really be in trouble on this one, but can you imagine the glory shows up and Democrat Christians and Republican Christians can hug each other. Because nothing matters in that realm except the will and the purpose of God. You want peace? Don't read your Bible to get peace. Don't pray to get peace. Don't come to church to get peace. Brother David, what are you saying? I'm saying first, get in the secret place of intimacy with him. Just talk to him. Bear yourself before him. Then from there, read your Bible. From there, pray. From there, go to church. You'll walk in and you'll think it's a new dress and everybody's staring at you. And you'll say, they must like my dress. And they say, no, it's deeper than the dress, sweetie. You've been somewhere this week, haven't you? Well, I just had good prayer times. We can tell. It shines all over you. Are you understanding? Or a young man opens his mouth and shares a testimony and the glory of God fills the building. And he was worried about how good he would be and God says, stop all that. Just be what I want you to be. Father, I pray for everyone online, for everyone here, and I pray for me, especially me, God. Help me come to the mountain of the Lord. Help us, oh God, come into that place that we have been 
in your presence so much that we've had that breakthrough that everyone around us will say, what happened to you? Lord, it won't be that we come out and try to speak some fancy thing or to share some revelation or dress a certain way or walk a certain way. It'll be without a word spoken that they know we've been with you. Father, as for me in my house, I pray that we will not minister to heaven, but that we will minister from heaven. I pray for all of our children and young people, God, that they will have an encounter with you that is beyond what this world has ever seen. I pray, God, for the future of our nation, for the future of our world, and I pray it this way. Lord, it all sits on the future of the church. And I pray that your church will find themselves in an intimate place with you. And the last thing I'll say is the Lord said, David, when you come into that intimacy, that is the warfare. Because I'll fight the battle for you. In my presence is righteousness and truth. And my mind and my word and my faith and my direction and my protection. In his presence is fullness of joy. In his presence. If you're with me this morning and you hunger for that place, slip your hand up all over the building. Father, we raise our hands online. We raise our hands and say, God, help us get to that place. The place where everyone around us can see your glory shining from our lives. We honor you. We thank you. Our peace will be in your presence. In Jesus' mighty name. And we all said, Amen. 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 If you love him, come on, give him a hand of praise. Thank you so much for coming today. As of the moment, there is no service Wednesday night. We normally the New Year's Eve, uh, we, we kind of take off. I might post something, though, because I might slide up here and uh, have a, a what? Oh, that is your birthday, huh? Oh, it is your birthday. Okay. Anyway, it's family's birthday, too. So, forgot that. Sorry, this has been a crazy week. But anyway, watch Facebook. Might let you know something. We love you all. God bless you. Those online, remember, give the five. And we thank you so much for coming. God bless you all. God bless you.